It has been a call to order this regular meeting of the Verona Township Council for Monday, the 18th of August, 2024. Madam Clerk, would you please read the Open Public Meetings Act and by its stage? Notice requirements for the Open Public Meetings Act have been satisfied with respect to this meeting of the Township Council. The meeting time and date <clears throat> were included in the public meeting notice along with the public internet link and telephone call in information. Said notice and meeting agenda was posted in the municipal building and sent to the official newspapers of the township, the Verona City Road Times, and the Star Ledger at least 40, 48 hours preceding the start time of this meeting. The agenda and public handouts can be viewed online at veronanj.org slash council meetings. A public comment period will be held in the order it's listed on the meeting agenda and instructions on how to comment will be provided at the appropriate time. Thank you, Madam Clerk. To call the roll, please. Councilwoman Holland? Here. Councilman Roman. Here. Deputy Mayor McAvoy. Here. Mayor Tamboro. Here. Mayor also present is Township Manager Joseph Yarko, Tem Deputy Township Manager Kevin O'Sullivan, Township Attorney Brian Alloy, and myself, Municipal Clerk Jennifer County. Thank you. Whatever it is, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. You lead us to the flag of the United States of America and to the Lord which is the one of the nation, one of God, to all. Justice Thank you. So, two items for the mayor's report today. My cabinet. Okay. All of us. Yeah. Um, so, the Open Space Committee met to review potential properties for preservation in the long run. Uh, we reviewed possible uses and improvements for township homes that we already have. Additionally, we reviewed the financial status of the Open Space Trust Fund and the potential impact of the upcoming property tax revaluation on the trust fund. The committee welcomed new members who were immediately engaged in the process, which was wonderful to see, and brought a, uh, some great experience with them to the committee. I'd like to thank our Police Department, Public Works, and EMS uh, who were out last night in the storm. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't a, as horrible as we've had, uh, but there were still some disturbances and disruptions. Uh, as the hurricane season approaches, I ask everybody to be prepared, and I urge all residents to really heed weather-related warnings. Um, when the National Weather Service issues a warning, it means something is imminently happening versus a watch, which is a possibility, and it does take a significant amount to actually for them to issue a warning. So I urge everybody to actually follow them. Almost all of the incidents that we tend to have that are almost tragic are, you know, horrible car accidents and things like that tend to be because people are out when they shouldn't be. So I uh, I hope that everybody will heed those warnings uh, and move forward from there. And uh, finally, I wish our students uh, best wishes for their return to school in September. Um, and I wish our teachers and our sports staff uh, a great return to work as well. And that is my report, Mr. Fultray. Captain Liaison. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Hopefully you're all doing well. I only have a few items also. Um, We'll start with September 11, which is a Wednesday at 8 a.m. at Eagle Rock Reservation. We'll have our annual uh, ceremony, you know, remembering 9-11, uh, tragic things that occurred on that particular day. Um, then we have, I'll leave these all with the uh, town clerk, on Tuesday, September 24th, we have a senior wellness, which is at uh, Cody Arena, 560 Northfield Avenue, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, if you're seniors in the nation, you can contact uh, Anthony Puglisi in the Public Information Office. And finally, on um, fall festival already coming up is the fall, uh, Sunday, September 29th. Uh, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Essex County Environmental Center. Rain date will be Saturday, October 5th. Um, we're going to have a full fun day, 4-H, grass displays, seasonal refreshments, canoeing, hiking, 
pumpkin patch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Mr. Mayor, that's about it. Does anyone have anything for me? I have one item. I would like to encourage our residents to attend Barktoberfest on September 7th at the Turtleback Zoo. Um, it's a pet adoption day, right? Yes. At Turtleback Zoo. Uh, if I went, I would go home with every dog, but mm -hmm. um, but it, that is a, a wonderful offering at the zoo. So I encourage everybody. Don't tell my wife because she will come home with a dog that I don't need. One is fine. <laughs> All of them is the problem, Jay. This is true. Anything else? Anything from the culture? Thank you. Or need to do this with the clerk. Mr. Fiarco. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the agenda, um, just the advisory on the RFPs for streetscape design will be coming in September 9th, and then we will set up a later date for the Mayor and Council for the proposals to be presented to the Mayor and Council. Uh, fundraising by a professional firm is being discussed with the various groups. And just for discussion of the council, I did send you a draft policy on naming. Uh, I'd appreciate your comments on that draft. Uh, that will help me uh, get that in my final form for you. Staff is already reviewing it, as is the town attorney. Um, item 18 on my agenda, Everett Field will take up. Uh, after our guest presentations on solar, so, um, we have a report that uh, has been prepared for you on, on the project and a request to go out for final design. Um, and then the Bluefield Avenue Veteran Ban on Project is completed and fully funded by the community. Uh, and you'll see those up for the next holiday. They'll be up during uh, Veteran's Month and Memorial Day. Memorial. That'll turn over to the in our solar, solar feasibility projects. Good evening. Uh, I will quickly go through my report. I will defer on the discussion on Everett until after our solar presentation. But I'll highlight some of the items on my report uh, for this evening. Um, the pool rate study continues. Uh, we did meet today to discuss some of the uh, current finances and, and figures for the current pool season. We're pulling that into uh, final form on the strategic plan and the rate recommendations, which will be discussed and presented to the council either in late September or early October. Uh, smoke testing continues on the sewer collection system. Again, this is uh, an important project to identify the source of all the uh, extraneous flow that's coming through our sewer system. Uh, we have approximately completed 50% of the collection system throughout the town, and we continue to proceed with that smoke testing throughout the rest of the town over the next several weeks. Uh, we also have uh, two larger projects that are out for RFQ for the wastewater plant. That's the UVD disinfection system and the microscreen project. We'll be receiving those RFQs in... Uh, on August 28th, and we'll be making recommendations for contracts in September. Uh, similarly, the, the Clarifier Pumping Station project is ready for bidding as soon as we receive authorization from the iBank. Uh, as far as our water wells go, the Lynn Drive well project continues, uh, remains on schedule. We'll be back in service by the end of the year. Fairview Avenue well, again, we are waiting still for iBank authorization. Uh, we do have a pending application to Green Acres, so they, uh, we're waiting for them to communicate with each other and give us authorization to advertise that project. Again, uh, same vein with Clarice Drive Pump Station, we have uh, permits received from the state. The revised plans have been submitted to the iBank on July 29th, and we are waiting for iBank authorization. Uh, we are looking to schedule a meeting with iBank on, on a number of pending projects that we're waiting for authorization on. Uh, we, as, as far as the parking meters go, we did install our parking meter kiosks. We do have training for parking enforcement tomorrow. We do expect the new parking meter kiosks to be placed into operation in the coming one to two weeks. Um, we continue to advance our local government energy audit. Again, that's another presentation that we anticipate this fall. 
Uh, we are waiting for the final version of recommendations, but that will be a separate presentation to the council. Uh, and then the ADA playground continues. Uh, the contractor is actively installing playground equipment. They will be advancing through the other site work on the project over the next two to three weeks, and it will leave them ready for installation of the prefabricated ADA restroom uh, approximately at the completion of their remaining site work. So they are remaining on schedule with that project. Uh, with Linden Avenue, uh, we did meet with the Complete Streets Technical Assistance Team on August 14th. They have uh, recommended a number of temporary demonstrations for traffic and speeding control uh, issues on Linden Avenue. Uh, those are going through final review and recommendations, and then we'll, we'll, we will be coordinating communication and workshops, uh, public workshops, uh, as we move forward. And we will implement final recommendations into the final design for paving in 2025. Um, number of our other paving projects are complete. Uh, we did have a, uh, we did attend the pre-construction meeting for the county's Bloomfield Avenue repaving project. Uh, we had anticipated some striping on Bloomfield Avenue to uh, help identify and delineate parking spaces versus travel lanes, and to also delineate uh, 25 mile per hour speed zones on Bloomfield Avenue. The striping and the, uh, the markings in the road were postponed so we can hear the the, uh, the county's paving schedule at today's pre-construction meeting. The contractor does begin, I uh, anticipate beginning construction in late September or possibly October. Uh, it will be a full repaving of the entire length of Bloomfield Avenue. They did identify that they anticipate because Verona, they haven't identified exactly which side of Bloomfield Avenue they will be starting, but because Verona is centrally located on Bloomfield Avenue, they expect the paving to occur in 2025 for Verona. Uh, so in that light, we will be scheduling the striping on Bloomfield Avenue for one evening this week. Uh, the pickleball courts are being prepared for final bid documents and will be advertised for bid in the next several days. Uh, we've continued to work on a uh, number of street tree issues. We've completed our windshield tree survey. We've met with the Shade Tree Commission, and we have continued to advance the removal of several hazardous trees and trimming of hazardous trees uh, or hazardous branches. We are continuing to work with Shade Tree on ongoing capital investments required to maintain the street tree needs. Um, in the interest of time, I think, oh, and then uh, one other item worth uh, identifying is the Town Hall Windows and Repointing Project. Uh, we have been working with the architect. We are nearly complete with the final bid documents, and we are anticipating uh, going out to bid in the next several weeks for the window replacement and repointing. This is phase one of a two-phase project. Uh, we, we will be bidding the entirety of the project to see if we get favorable pricing. But again, that will be anticipated for sometime, uh, an award sometime in late uh, 2024 or construction in early 25. Thank you, Mr. O'Sullivan. Any questions? Councilman Rohn. Uh, just any kind of interim update on, on what they're finding during the smoke testing, anything, any early results? Uh, they've been sending weekly results as they complete each section uh, that they've been working in. There, it, there's been a mixed bag of, of findings. There are, um, there are some uh, properties that have been identified to have roof drains or lawn inlets tied into the sewer system. Uh, there are a few catch basins throughout the township that have uh, seemed to have some sort of interconnection with the sewer line. So as we're finding these items, we're, we're documenting them, we're tabulating them, and then we'll be working with uh, Boswell in preparing a phased approach to try to address and eliminate as many of these interconnections as possible. Again, in the interest of trying to reduce and eliminate as much of this ext extraneous flow as possible from the sewer system. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Um, you guys are up to the phone and introduce yourself. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council. 
Mayor, mm -hmm. my name is Walt Jordan. I'm vice president with DJ Energy Partners, and I'm here to talk about solar with you guys today. Um, not present, who was supposed to be here, but because of the weather um, was canceled, was Adam from uh, Campus Innovations, our strategic partner. So with that said, before I get started, I just have a few quick things. Um, first thing is, uh, I want to thank you all. This is a thankless act that you guys serve your community, serving in my hometown on my PNZ and EDC boards. It is it is a great service that you provide to your community. So you all should be commended for that. Second thing is, as I'm presenting today, I thrive on your interaction. So I'm a little different than most. Knock me off my axis, ask questions. Throw me a curveball in the middle of my presentation. I welcome that interaction as we get started. So, away we go. In your packets there, you will find copies of some 3D renderings that we've put together for some sites. We've been working with Kevin and Joe um, in several variations of, of different locations, different spots, trying to find the ones that work the best. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today, how these things tie together working through the feasibility of a project here. So first one that we've got is the Lakeside Avenue parking lot. I uh, really like the way this, this looks um, from 3D rendering and how we've been able to put this together. Um, the lot obviously is gonna need some work to it to accomplish this establishment, but um, this, is a, this is a really cool project and, and sets up nicely for the aggregate net metering that's available to the town. Um, and using the power of production to be pushed forward um, to other sites. So, in the interest of interrupting you as you requested, yes, ma'am. How large is this? Um, three hundred feet. Yeah, I'm, from a you talking about from a square footage standpoint, or mm -hmm. from? That's a good question that I don't have the answer to. We'll have no. to speak That's more. helpful. It's just, yeah, thank you. Yeah. In the, in the solar space, we measure everything in watts, though. So. And I do understand that. I think it's just helpful to get a concept of, you know, height, space associated with it. Okay, so from the height and the space associated with it, um, you're going to have, and we can do it a couple different ways. It can be anywhere from a nine-foot clearance to a 14-foot clearance. So in the in the interest of, you know, my, my biggest concern would be snow plows, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little allergic to those, and Part of the world I come from, but uh, I know it's a big deal here. So make it big enough so we can get a snow plow in there so that we can clear the snow out of there um, from the snow drifts and whatnot. But whatever it's, it's essentially whatever the size of that parking lot is, is going to be the size of the of the solar array system on top. So since you're touching on it, because I, I wrote it down right here, what about the snow load? So talking about, I mean, that's an e so that's an easy question, right? So traditionally in your snow loads, you want to have a 60 to 1 ratio in your dead loads, right? And so these are all engineered and designed to carry at a minimum of 60 to 1. Can go a little higher than that. So um, we install them in South Dakota. We install them in uh, Buffalo, New York. I mean, the areas where they see the most snowfall in the country, right? So um, they're engineered to handle that um, specifically to your climate, and this will be maxed out. From a snow load. When, and this is pitched, so all snow goes off the back of it? That's correct. Okay. So then, then back to uh, the councilwoman's question, the height. So I'm guessing the height would be a lot higher in the front than put in the rear. Traditionally 14 feet. Okay. Traditionally 14 feet slopes back to nine. Um, we, we, would, we would design it from an engineering perspective, again, to make sure that the snow block can get in there and do his business and get out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If I, if I may, uh, before any work is done, if, if you're going to speak, you got to come up. So the uh, my apologies. Before any work is done, yeah, before any work is done, and my name is Tom Brown. I'm the CEO of the company. Um, well, we're gonna we'll submit all engineering documentation with the 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 business office, and we'll in in that process we give all the engineering documents that show the snow loads, so that we show that um, everything can meet or exceed the standards set by the city for the city and the county as well as the state. So. Thank you. Yeah, so the next location that we have here is, is the municipal lot. Um, again, be 14 feet on the front, nine feet on the back. We can make adjustments to that as necessary. Um, this just gives you a nice bird's eye view. Panels are gonna go from a production standpoint, so. 
Any questions on municipal parking lot one? Um, I'm not seeing any sort of equipment yards or other, you know, infrastructure facilities associated with this. Is the entire system integrated in the canopies or does it require ground mounted facilities as well? No ground mounted facilities. So all the inverters um, and everything is run um, to the closest utility meter that's there. Either we bore underground or we'll trench one or the other. So. Thanks, Jim. This is municipal parking lot number two. Similar to parking lot number one. So this is your waste treatment facility currently. Um, part of this incorporation here is we've got a uh, we've got a roof coating built in um, over the the metal shed, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more a little further in the presentation and why that's important in the process and how our system works tied in with the roofing and the solar being a single unified engineered component. Well, to clarify for the public, the the image is actually showing our TPW garage, which is near the wastewater treatment facility, but it's actually on public works garage. Yes, we when we put this together, there were several variations that we put together, and there were a lot of questions surrounding where we could put panels and how they could affect certain parts of the waste treatment facility. So um, this is this is kind of where we landed at the end of the day. Okay. You know, there's an old panel, an old system there that's out of service. I think it's on one of the other buildings there. Uh, it's currently on that building. It is on this building. Okay. But yes. Yeah. Yes. Did you did you explore putting it on the building across from this, the other the maintenance garage there? Because I know that roof is getting replaced soon. So we we have talked about it, but that was not confirmed when we put this together. Okay. It, it can be done. That's an option that's, that's readily okay. available. Um, my recommendation is having a roofing background as a whole is put solar on it. I'm going to explain further about that here in a minute. Okay. Is there a reason not to put it over the digesters? So we weren't sure because we're not in the digester business. Um, we weren't sure if this, how much the sunlight had an effect to it and blocking the sun could affect the digester and the productivity of the digester. That was, that was. Looking at the uh, at an aerial of the facility right now, and it does look like the existing panels are on the advanced treatment building and the office building there. Um, and I think it's the older system that's uh, that's off. I'm just kind of curious if there's any reason not to replace that system in its in its current place as well. So the one that we've got drawn here, if I'm not mistaken, Kevin, you can correct me, but the one that we've got drawn here. On this particular roof, that's the roof that I'm almost certain has the panels on it right now currently, yes? There, there might be some on there, but if you look, um, if, if you would basically, you see the you see the, the the tanks in the lower left picture there? Yes, sir. If you went basically a little further to the left and down, uh, you would see the plant administration building and the uh, and the uh, advanced treatment building, and th that those buildings have panels on their roofs. That's the system that I'm referring to that's... Um, that uh, is out of service. Okay, uh, it's a much smaller roof than what you've got, got drawn there, so so you might not be able to get as much panel density. But that's where we had uh, solar at one point in time. Okay, ready to look. I do think there is some small solar on the DPW garage. And if I may, I, um, I think we should probably look at that. First off, it's, it's not operating in this decommission. Mm -hmm. from, just from a safety standpoint, just so you understand, solar panels are going to always continually change electricity or send into electricity. So right. we, we, we should remove those and then dispose of them appropriately for you mm -hmm. um, at a minimum. But it's also a really good idea, possibly, we could add additional solar there if it makes sense. But Right, because the building electrical system is probably already set up for tie-in and everything. You yeah, know. there's already an interconnection approval there. So right. with a, an existing interconnection approval, the utility won't require us to do it again, as long as we match the exact same system mm -hmm. AC size. But we should definitely explore that, and I think we will. It <laughs> makes sense to me. Right. Right. Yes. All right, so the next slide that we have is the community center. Um, 
We've got a new roof built into this. You can see we've we've replaced the uh, black EPDM roof with a white TPO roof. Um, we've also added in um, the GAF Cool Series shingles um, specifically for this project, and there's a there's a direct correlation as to why we've done that. And then we've also added in some additional uh, parking lot structures as well. So we bring this together, we talk about where our costs fall, how the costs play into this. And so friction point on the front end, right? The friction point is the upfront cost and, and how the project comes together. This is based on a cash model um, with the city of Verona owning the actual project themselves. And it comes... and through the Department of Treasury and the direct pay portion of it underneath the IRA, which is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, that offset that $8.9 million cost and then how we've arrived at those figures. So what I've done is I've broken down each facility uh, from a model that goes with it. And if you look on the layered in the we've got in the New Jersey Okay. First. Correct that since this is a Well, offset on these when we're talking about the lots is just going to be a little bit different where we're we don't have a utility bill that we're going to offset from to to look for an ROI. So essentially all of the generation station is going to be layered back into your other facilities where um you're using power from a solar perspective. I wanted to ask about one of the figures I saw on here. You're showing the annual energy use. I'm looking at some of these parking lots and you show 1.8 million kilowatt hours. Is that intended to reflect the existing energy use that the facility would be using? Because I kind of don't see how a parking lot would be, you know, what, what does that number represent? So yeah, but the EV charges. So yeah. that's yeah. So um one of the what, what's happening out of this program, and again, you'll be breaking some ground here. So we'll right. we'll, we'll we'll take our time to make sure that it's all approved before we move forward to spending, but um, we're using this land, which obviously doesn't create or use energy, or it doesn't use energy, um, but it'll be applied to your energy bills. So what you're, what you're seeing there is actually the amount of energy that would be created. So it's not going to be, it doesn't reflect how much power is being used on the site, but it does reflect how much energy will be offsetting on your other bills, your other energy bills. Okay. So that's the, that's the expected annual generation of each of these, of, of this site. Yes, maybe. that is correct. And, and it's, and it's escalating over time. As the as we project, you know, energy prices to go up over time. Okay, so well, the the, yeah. annual, the actual generation, you know, in kilowatt hours, it's not going to ask. It's actually going to go down. Correct. It's, it's going to decrease at a half a percent a year. Okay. Yeah. And the, and then also, sorry, one more. Um, you you list a federal tax credit here. Obviously, we're a government entity, and we're not you know paying federal taxes. Yes, right. Is that a just a cash credit for us? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the way the direct pay works is the incentives from if you were a for profit entity are issued to you in the form of a tax credit. But since you are a government entity through the IRA back in 2022, they've created the direct pay portal, and then you get a check directly from the Department of Treasury. Right. Okay. That's all I have for me. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys updating this presentation to provide some uh, additional look into the, the financials here, because I think it's really helpful. In your spreadsheet, you're identifying the New Jersey TREC. Um, I would just ask that you take a closer look at that and determine whether or not it's actually going to be the SREC 2 um, that this project would qualify for and whether or not those financials remain the same, um, because I'm not sure if the timing would uh, allow for TREC credits. In regards to the TREC credits, right? One of the problems that we that is available with is it's 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 not going to be it's not necessarily consistent for how they're going to issue it over the course of the next fifteen. Mm -hmm. It's made some they've made some changes um, previously, and, and yeah. here we are in the new state now. So 
All we can do is predict based upon the modeling and the data that we've got available to us as it sits right now. Mm-hmm. And as those changes are made throughout the years, it could fluctuate up or down. Okay. I do still think it's not the T-Rex any longer. It's probably the s too. too. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So um, It's called the Susie credit. The, the, Thank you. Um, and I'm going to, again, it's, it's, it's similar to the fact that it says federal tax credit when, it, when it, that's not labeled properly for a, for a nonprofit. So that's a software update. Yeah. No, and I, I do appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that like there is some information. And if that baseline number in, in the spreadsheet is based on a prior T-REC formula, I just want to make sure that you're confirming yeah. the, the SUSE um, formula. So yes. if, if we can just confirm that, that would be tremendously helpful. Yeah. So what happens is um, we're going to, as you know, it sounds like you're very familiar with the, with the programs in New Jersey. Um, we make an interconnection application. Obviously, that's what verifies that we can do the aggregate program, which, again, is uh, being adjusted. And, and your city has already had conversations with the PSCNG on this particular matter. The other thing is we make application for the financial payment, which is a separate application, and then we qualify on that. And then that's the case when we can lock in the rates. And so if there's timing changes, and, and so the actual hard numbers, um, as we move forward in this process, we'll make that application. That'll be the first applications we make is to, for, for the financing uh, picture from the state, as well as the interconnection application. And then before the city is obligated to pay, you know, for this project, these projects going forward, we'll lock all that those rates and the interconnection applications. In. Yeah. So this is uh, the figures for municipal lot one. Um, it's layered in exactly the same way as we showed on the previous slide, and I've broken these down for you um, by location with the graphs. So what what the graphs represent is the yellow represents what we can produce in solar power. Obviously, in this particular property, we don't have a utility offset, so it's going to max it out the way it's structured from a software standpoint. So a um, couple of the other properties, it'll show the actual utility usage for that physical property. Mm-hmm. So there's your wastewater plant that we offset. And, you know, it's a nice system. capturing a percentage of the power that's there. So um, that's your biggest power consumption um, station in the entire um, fleet of Verona facilities that we've seen. The municipal lot two. Can you talk a little bit about the, your first, the second column here, uh, O&M and M and equipment replacement? Mm-hmm. You have it projected out thirty years. Correct. Is that the total replacement cost? No. Or is it every fifteen years? So, so the panels come with a third year warranty and a, and a fifteen year labor warranty that come with it from the manufacturer. Okay. okay. I see the jump at year fifteen. Well, the reason there's a jump at year fifteen is because of the inverters. Okay. So inverters are like a set of tires. They're just going to wear out. That's going to be the conversion of DC to AC power. Um, and they just wear out. So that's why that cost is associated there in year 15 so that it can be accounted for. So as, as a good steward of the solar industry, it is our recommendation that you have the system serviced a couple times a year. Make sure you don't have any crow's wires. Um, I don't necessarily know that cleaning your panels is necessarily overly important. You'll get enough snow and annual rainfall that they should be washed on their own just by nature. I don't know if you guys have a heavy bird population, pigeons or geese, something of that nature that could create some, some challenges that are there. It's not like we're in a dairy or, you know, somewhere like that. If this was in Arizona or Nevada where your annual rainfall is less than 10 inches a year, well, that's a different story uh, from the purposes of cleaning them. So it's meant to, to work on the system, make sure that the system is functioning properly, that, you know, everything's online and moving forward and, the recommendations twice a year have the system checked. So that's what the O and M accounts for in that in that perspective. Thank you. So this is the community center. As you can see we've got a hundred percent of the total um, from the power uses that we get from the kilowatts um, being offset from the solar. Um, our biggest production is coming in the summer. 
it's it's interesting when you're in different parts of the of the country where your biggest peak months are um, and your power consumption. Um, down in the south, it's always in the summer because you're running the AC on full blast. And here, y'all are running the furnace in the winter on full blast. So um, it's always interesting to see how those those teeter depending upon where you're at. Is there any reason why the Verona pool is not looked at in this? Because I understand that, that building, when it was designed, they actually specifically built that roof to be structurally adequate for solar. But um, because at that time there wasn't net metering, they never put a system on it. But that's another old facility we have. Good question. So we reviewed the we reviewed the uh, the pool. Um, we looked at the pool, and um, realistically, when we were we were trying to tailor it down where we were going to go with the project, that was that was one that. For whatever reason, was was pulled out of the equation. The yeah. economics were not favorable, or essentially, yeah, or, yeah right. it, it it just didn't come together um, the way we were looking at it, um, the size for it, and the cost, and then you know the real the real power that you can get from there would be to add more parking lots uh, with parking shade structures, et cetera. So that was was really kind of the option that was there, um, and so that it was more favorable to go to the other lots instead. <laughs> So we've got a total of about $7 million in incentives. Um, this is a two megawatt system as we've designed it. Um, obviously, there's a lot. And, and to be fair to this, there's a lot of data that we don't have and the town doesn't have, for that matter, that can help us really dial in and, and get us closer to what we're looking for from an interval data standpoint and, and working with your utility provider to gather that information. So that's part of you know where this process goes is you know, putting together the interconnection, doing the engineering, doing the studies with the interval data, uh, putting together a more robust, more dialed in concrete system. But as it stands right now, the incentives are great. Um, the system, the size system is huge. And this also gives you a facility by facility offset for um, where the power generation is versus, um, versus what you can make from the solar. So these are some fun numbers here. Wait, just real quick, if you wanted to go over the sizes, um, I can go those through those really quick with you, and we can also send them over. Just follow up. Okay. Very sure. So the environmental impact of this. So this is an estimate of three million miles. 682,000 trees planted. So it's got a it's got a very significant environmental impact as far as you know reading the meeting the city's carbon net zero goals uh, from a sustainability standpoint and and doing our part. So um, these are the figures. You know, 38,000 tons of carbon saved is a is a pretty spot on number. Um, that's a that's a nice nice ad for for the environment there. Okay. okay, so next slide here is, is the PSENG, the Aggregated Net Metering Program. Team systems. That is We've been in communication with PSENG, um, with Kevin and myself. We've uh, wastewater. As I had mentioned earlier, which is two million kilowatt hours. All right. So we're going to shift a little bit. We're going to talk about the roofs how the roofs play into this and why the roof is important. So the first roof that we're gonna talk about and the first type of roofing here is we're gonna talk about the community center. So what I've done is I've spec this roof with the GAF Cool Series shingled roof. It's part of the Cool Roof Ratings Council. It's Energy Star rated. Um, it's also uh, Title 24 out of California as well, which are all very important. Um, and in this exact proposal, 
it's part of your direct pay incentive. So 40% of your roof costs can come back to you in the form of a direct pay from the Department of Treasury by creating what we call the single unified engineered component. Here's how it works. Traditional roof, you go to Home Depot and you buy some shingles, you're going to get a black asphalt mat, three-dimensional shingle, laminated with 30-year, whatever you want to call it, and it's going to have a UV reflection rate that's less than 10, actually probably closer to 5. And the reason is it's a black asphalt mat, and it's going to absorb heat. Well, with the Cool Series is what it does is it's not made with a black asphalt mat. It's got a UV reflection rate, depending upon the color choice, of anywhere from 70 to 80. And what that does is that gives what we call the bounce back effect. And the way that the bounce back effect works is our panels are double sided like this, like double sided tape, right? So we collect sunlight on the top side, and then we have a panel on the back side that's catching the reflectivity from the roof. And we're converting that into power as well. Using the attachment methods with the roof, it becomes a one two punch. So we're capturing the reflectivity of the roof, and then we're using the substrate of the roof to anchor down the racking system, recognizing that as a single unified engineered component. We've also specced JM for the flat roofs in the community center um, using two layers of 2.2 inch ISO and a half inch HD ISO board and using the reflectivity of the TPO roof again to capture that solar power, um, also to capture that reflectivity off of the roof. And so to give you guys a little bit of an example, this slide shows how that bounce back works. So it's a bifacial module. So all the sunlight that hits that panel is going to capture as much of it as we can. We can't capture all of it. And then what passes through heats up that membrane or heats up that cool series shingle, and the bounce back comes right back into the panel on the backside, catching that and turning that into power. So any of your roofing systems that you're going to replace the bifacial module is what allows you to capture 40% of that cost back in a direct pay, which is part of the incentives package that we've laid out. A couple of other cool features. This is, uh, this is the monitoring system and how the monitoring system looks. Um, this is in Fort Worth, Texas at Tanger Outlet Malls. And this is during the total eclipse back in April, 100% totality. And you can see where the where the eclipse took place. But this is the monitoring that's in live time that can be at your fingertips from your phone, from your iPad, from your desktop, et cetera. So you have the ability in live time to monitor exactly what you want. You can dial into a single cell on a single panel if that's what you want. And this part of this comes back to the maintenance piece that we talked about underneath the O&M side, right? So you'll get an alert like a text message or a notification on your phone that'll say, hey, row four panel L produced 80% less power yesterday than it has the two days before. So the system is able to generate and give you all kinds of data, compounds it on a regular basis, allows you to be able to, in lifetime, know what's going on with your system at all times. So we're using the ZN Shine bifacial module, 2,955 panels. This comes with a 30-year warranty and the 15-year labor warranty using a tier one panel. Also comes with 20 SunGrow inverters using with Tygo rapid shutdowns as well. Really like the Tygo piece to it. That's a safety factor that plays into it with your um, firemen. If there's a fire on one of these facilities, heaven forbid, but it gives them the you know, the safety factor from being able to come in and fight the fire and not have to worry about being electrocuted um, from the system, still being on, still being hot, producing power, et cetera. So some successful projects, we are the solar installer for UPS, um, our first large format solar project was here in New Jersey for UPS specifically. Um, we've got I think 13 UPS uh, distribution centers here in New Jersey that we've put together. This is Gershomer Glass in Vineland, New Jersey. I listened earlier, Mayor, when you were talking about, you know, weather warning, weather watch, et cetera. Well, this was finished and installed and interconnected a month before Hurricane Sandy. There was no damage to the panels. There was no damage to the roof. This is the largest rooftop 
at the time, it was the largest rooftop glass manufacturing plant in the world um, that we installed. So the system performed beautifully in the most adverse condition, uh, conditions. And when you work with a glass factory, there's a couple of key components, and I'm bragging a little bit here, but they never lost power. They have a boiler and they have a furnace that can never lose power. So this facility's power was never turned off during this entire installation. And this installation will be about two megawatts today, um, or excuse me, about 10 megawatts today. So this is uh, Deptford Schools. Um, also in New Jersey, another large format solar project that we've done here in the state. And then I also understand that you guys have a facility that y'all are working on putting together from the standpoint of um, your emergency services. So police, fire, EMS, et cetera. And we've been in contact and had some initial conversations with the architect um, pushing forward on that to have the discussions of solar and have the discussions of using the right roof to be able to capture that cost back. And it goes hand in hand with what we've shared with you guys today is that that exact system will work the same as it pertains to the new roof that's gonna go on the emergency services center. You're gonna pay for the roof regardless, but this gives you the opportunity to capture up to 40% of that money back um, through the direct pay initiative by putting solar on that facility. There's a lot of unknowns still of that project, but just kind of planting the seed that those options are available. Yeah. Sure. Sure. A couple more? Yeah, go far away. Yeah, the bifacial modules that you talked about, are they on like the parking garage areas too? And do, do you get as much production from being in that area as with a roof? No, you don't get quite the same production unless you've got a white surface underneath there, something that's going to reflect up, right? So your parking lot is traditionally going to be black. Um, so it's not going to have the same reflectivity that you would get from a TPO roof or PVC or a metal roof. So but we, we will use the bifacial module on the park. So yes, got it. And then backing up to the, that cool series roof, is that is that a 30-year roof or is it a 50-year roof? I know like EDPM flat roofs are 50, but the other one that you were talking about too, the TPO, what's the Correct. life of that? Let's stay with cool series for just a second. Okay. So back in around 2010, GAF changed the game. And they went away from the 20-year, the 25-year, the 30-year model. And they went to what they called the lifetime, right? <laughs> and so they don't, they don't use that vernacular anymore. But the, the roofing system comes with a 20-year, no dollar limit warranty. So that's labor and materials across the 20-year period. It's got 160 mile an hour wind rating. It's also got the new HDZ technology with the uh, Duralock. Um, glue system and the wider nail lines for it. And it's probably the most, it, it's got an unlimited wind rating. But I mean, it's probably one of the, if not the best shingle in the market to this very day. So when you talk about TPO, the options that are available in the project, when you talk about TPO, you can do a no dollar limit warranty. It's going to come with a 20 year manufacturer's warranty out of the box, right? But if you start to get into the MDLs, which is what we've priced here, you get into a 10 year, 15 year, 20, 25, or up to a 30 year, um, no dollar limit warranty. So year 17, year 22, there's a problem with that roof. It's under the warranty and it's going to be the cost to replace the roof at whatever that cost is 22 years from now, 17 years from now, however that works. And so the manufacturer is there with us before, during, and after the install to certify the installation. And as one of their preferred contractors, that's how you're able to push out that NDL warranty. Do you find that they last longer because there's solar panels over them or that's just the life of them because they're generating? That's a great question. So yes, they, they will because they're not taking all of that UV reflection. The only, the only roofing product that's out there is a silicone roof coating is the only roofing product that the sun doesn't cause depredation to. So when you talk about the solar panels, it's almost like having you know, a patio cover in your backyard, right? It's going to be cooler underneath your patio cover. It's not taking the direct sunlight. It works the same way. It's going to extend the lifetime of the roof. Yes. Thank Just you. because the UV reflection doesn't tear it down. So reviewing all of these different, all the different financials, there are different estimates for when we see positive cash flow from them. Assuming we get all of the government incentives looking at a liability on township about $1.7 million, right? Um, I guess question for you and for our administration is, 
has anybody aggregated all of these numbers and come up with an estimate for exactly how long in years it would take between our cost savings on our utility bills plus what we're putting back into the system or when we would realize a positive cash flow on this all together. Yeah, so the overall um, modeling that we've come up with is roughly right at about 12 years. And is there a financing cost we're paying on, on the system? Is that incorporated into this? Or are we, you know, would we have to bond for the cost out of our own you know, as a township debt? What's actually the financial model when making this happen? We're going to be our Sorry? We're going to be bonding our portion. Okay. So when these numbers were determined, did that include the bonding costs, the interest, and all of that? And these these are all preliminary numbers. All of this will be going to the auditor. But because we've been in administration working on this for a year, it's at the stage where we need to bring you up to speed on uh, where we would be going and, and is the council uh, conceptually online with this so we can keep moving with what we're doing. It would all go to the auditors also. Next, we already cleared uh, the company via uh, co-ops um, and those guidelines we have to deal with. Administration has looked at other uh, vendors and since there are preferred at this point in time, but there is a lot of work to do there. That's the first point I would just like to see as we go forward is we're here to install all these items and every year they decrease in their efficiency, right? Eventually there's a sweet spot as far as when with the financial benefit of this, when are we actually seeing that popped up cash flow? And of course, once we hit that, that number that we're actually turning in profit goes down every year, right? Um, to the point that when we have to replace these items, when the warranty expires, we're looking at another cycle of that, or you you don't have these things. Um, right. The other, so that's the economic analysis that I see on that is when we have bonding costs included, when you have interest, because everything costs twice as much when we finance it, right? uh, which could minimize any savings that we're getting, depending on what the, what the bond payments will look like. Right. So that, that's something that we definitely need to say. Um, the other piece of this is, is there an expense for disposing of these items when their useful life comes up? What does that look like? So good question as far as, let's start with the disposal piece, right? Um, we have panels that we've been modeling since the mid nineties that are still performing today at less than a 10% degradation tool. Now, It'd be like using a typewriter when you've got access to an iPad from the technology standpoint of where they're at. We're at a, we're at a real place as far as solar goes from the R&D standpoint. It's not like in you know, 2002, 2003, you go to Best Buy and buy a computer, and by the time you got home, it was, you know, it was obsolete because the technology was changing overnight. We've really made big strides using these bifacial modules, and we've really kind of hit a plateau from that standpoint. Um, we've got a project down in Puerto Rico that we're working on. They installed panels in 2007, so we're using what we call a 250 model. Um, well, here we are, you know, 15 years later, 16, 7, whatever it is, and, you know, these are a 550. So that just kind of gives you the evolution of where it's come to. A lot of the R&D money right now is really being sunk more in the battery space than it is in the solar space. The solar space has really kind of landed in a good spot. And then to further that, when you talked about earlier about the degradation of these panels, you're going to see most of your degradation in the first five years and they really just kind of level out after that. And you're going to probably see less than a 5% degradation. Case studies indicate, you know, that the numbers are lower than that, but to be conservative, roughly, you know, 5% is kind of a good place to start. And the system and the modeling, how we put this together, does that for us, right? So it's, it's accounting into that from the degradation standpoint. Yeah. Well, if I, I want to address the specific questions, though. End of life, um, what do we do with the system? All right, so um, we just did a study for Bear Pharmaceuticals on a large array that they were putting in. Um, basically, what we found was that because there's value to recycling the materials, because the, the racking systems are aluminum, 
And now the solar modules that are being designed, a lot of glass, a lot of recyclable material, there is a value to those, um, which offsets the labor cost. So what we're looking at in the removal of the system is really how much is the, um, the value of the, of the recyclable selling of materials, how much of that offsets the labor cost. So what we found in this particular project for Bear Pharmaceuticals was that was a break even number. Um, we can do an analysis, for example, on that facility that you have some older models on, and uh, we can get some quotes on that for recycling costs versus the, the labor costs. And well, that'll give you a really good idea of, of the, of the long-term cost. But if there is a need to remove or replace modules in the future, which is something that we're starting to see in the United States because the solar industry is now around that 20, 25 year mark as far as the large solar projects go. New Jersey, for example, is right at 20 years. Um, um, th that is becoming a very big, con uh, you know, something that people are very concerned about looking into. Um, again, um, the good news is that it, there's value in the recycling. So. Um, I would say that we're looking at five percent cost of the original installation for the removal, complete removal of the system. The other thing that I um, wanted to point out too is in these systems that we're installing, we are going to be putting in new roofing systems. So the ROI on a roof is basically infinity, right? There's no return on investment for a roof. But by incorporating the solar, which is the design that the city is looking at right now, there is an ROI on those roofs. So as Walt mentioned before, any time that we can incorporate a roof into the design, that's a value to the city because you are going to get a return on that dead investment. That it, so that's something that we'll highlight when we work with the, everyone on the numbers to show that, yeah, there is a longer ROI, but we're paying for roofs, which don't generally have an ROI. So, that, so there is added value there for a city you know, where that would just be a capital expense that you would never recover. But in this case, you get new roofs that last 30 years and you get, get to recover the cost of those. So anyway, stuff that I know, but it's fine. More questions? Councilman? Yes, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my first question is about the reflective. So when I look at your slide um, and your presentation, I believe it was slide 17. In addition to providing the benefit of additional solar generation, am I understanding the slide correctly that it actually helps to cool the facility as well, right? Because we're not absorbing all of that heat. So it actually would hopefully help us to reduce some of our energy consumption to cool spaces like the community center. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that would be an energy savings as well. Yes. Um, so well, that's let me add one more thing to your question there. On the insulation factor, when you talk about the roof, the roof's going to go to an R30 on the insulation. And currently right now, it's got a black EPDM roof on it that's got a UV reflection rate of zero. It was made and invented to make snow melt faster. And it's probably got a half inch perlite to one to two inches of um, SBS underneath it. That's, that's really maybe an R5 or seven, somewhere in that range. So it's going to make a drastic difference um, in the heating and cooling inside of that building as well. Well, that's very helpful because we do have a lot of recreation um, uses in that facility, and so it can get very, very stuffy at times. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. Clearly, a lot of time went into it. I want to thank Kevin and Joe as well um, for their leadership on this. I think it's really important. Um, I have been an advocate for us finding uh, creative ways to reduce our energy consumption, including utilizing solar. I do agree with the mayor that it would be really helpful to get into the financials a little bit deeper. Um, I do think that there's more opportunity, but I appreciate that you were candid that there's more granular data that you can drill into and there's opportunities to really get this to a more final stage that you're in a more conceptual point and that you wanted to hear our feedback after about a year of work on this. And so I do really wanna say how much I appreciate the time spent on this project. I think there might be opportunities for additional roofs as some of my colleagues referenced. Um, and I really challenge us to find ways of, if I look at your slide correctly, you're saying that we're only offsetting about 25% of our load. If there's an opportunity for us to offset more than that, I think that would be really helpful. And when we talk about financials, we also need to consider the fact that the costs are only increasing 
um, and that net metering actually is offsetting um, our T and D costs as well as the commodity. So like, I think it's really important for us to understand how those costs are increasing over time. And so how, you know, continuing to generate this electricity is actually saving us more money over time as those costs go up. Um, in fact, we're going to see large rate increases from the utility and uh, on the commodity side, probably within the next six to 12 months. So it's very substantial and it's really important for us to be doing what's necessary to offset those costs. That being said, I would also um, challenge the municipality and so the administration to really look at how we would maintain both these roofs and these solar facilities so that we don't have a situation as our other solar facility um, was not fully utilized. Um, so if there's an opportunity there for us to have lessons learned on our prior project. But again, I just really wanna thank you. I'd love to get that drilled down, more detailed financial analysis, but I understand that what you're looking for this evening is just kind of buy-in on the concept. And I, I definitely think that it's a positive concept that we should explore further and then really start ironing out some of those finer details. Yes. Mm -hmm. One other thing to add um, on your last statement there, if you look in the columns of each one of them, there's the O&M cost. That's, that's the, the cost from a group that specifically does that and makes sure that the system is generating and does the monitor. Yep. Excellent. So you don't run into the same issue where you've got paperweights sitting on your roof. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not very worthwhile at that point. No. Any other questions, guys? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Any questions, comments at your time to the material? Yeah, I mostly I kind of want to see sort of our team and our finance people sort of looking at this because I'm concerned about things like our bonding, our aggregate bonding capacity, or you know, there's there's a lot of things we need to look at our specific financial situation, do some of our own modeling. That's really kind of what I'm looking for. I like this conceptually. I think it's you know I've pushed for anything we can do to to manage utility costs in the past, and this is obviously, you know, does this. It's just a large-scale project. I want to make sure that it doesn't, you know, that it fits in the rest of the puzzle here. Understood. And and yes, it was on the council's list for the past two years, two and a half. Two. Well, so we appreciate uh, this coming to coming to the table then. Yes, sir. I, th I think my comments, uh, I was add to what I had before, um, I think that finance piece is going to be really big and some pretty thorough analysis. I think the other thing that we need to be cognizant of as well is the proposed insulation on Lakeside Avenue uh, in looking at that graphic in comparison to the other homes and stuff that was a little overwhelming. So I think we should be aware of the impact on our neighbors there uh, and, uh, and really speak to the homeowners around that area. Uh, yeah. Just the other the other places don't have that. We kind of assume that time went to mass, knowing that we may have to do some adjustments. And that was a great collection of stuff out. Yes. yes. So uh, uh, yeah, I, think, uh, I think the Councilman Roman's suggestion, because uh, like you said, we've been talking about this for years, something that we've wanted to do, but, but the Verona pool was the one that always comes up because it's full sunlight all the time. Uh, and I'm thinking if we did the parking, uh, cover parking there, we have two two different parking levels there. Uh, I think that's an ideal place for us. I think, think that's an area we should really look into. If, if we were to replace some municipal lot two and move those dollars over to the pool, that would probably, you know, there's there's obviously an opportunity that's there. We've, I think, would you give me 20, 25 sites to look at? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. A lot, okay. right? So it's just, we have a lot of buildings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it, right? This, this is fun for me, strangely. So, you know, the pool can be an option, right? There, if, if there's a building that y'all want to see solar on specifically, I mean, you can put solar on this building and replace these shingles with the cool series roof if you want to. I mean, we just reworked this building a couple of years ago. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, I understand. I understand, but I, I saw some water stains. So, I, you know, that's the windows. End of that pointing. Yeah. 
you know, because my, my thoughts are always I, the parking areas are great because summertime, obviously, we all know it. You come out, you get in your car. Uh, it might stop people from turning their car on with their automatic starter 15 minutes before they get to their car. Uh, and even with EVs now, uh, the, you won't use the electric to keep the car as cool if you're, you're in a covered area. So I think these areas are really, I think, important areas that we should look at. And I do agree with the mayor that the structure, to cover that entire lot with the structure, that, that looks looks massive. Yeah. So I think that's an area maybe we can take some away from there and add up to other areas. Just my thought. But thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Derek, do you have anything else before we hit every feeling? Um, mm -hmm. No, I have a closed session. Okay. You can post all of it back to you then. Sure. Uh, Edward, yeah. Do you want to discuss everything on the air? Yeah, you want. Wait, someone and I met with the, uh, the deputy mayor on his concerns twice on the app. Yeah. yeah. And going over his list. It, important is that this evening what we need from the council to stay on schedule is the authorization to go to design which is what you need the final design before we even go to lodging um and so there'll be another review with the council we're losing time on potential next potential grants if we don't get this to the designers so we'll go over hopefully field again our questions from the deputy mayor the entire council had and our responses to those questions. Thank you again. Um, so we did, as as Mr. Diarco mentioned, we did sit with the deputy mayor to review the Everett Field concept plans. Uh, we did we did sort through some of the comments. Uh, I think some of the comments are well received, and 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 uh, can uh, final design elements can be uh, modified to reflect some of those suggestions and comments. I think, namely, there was some maneuvering and manipulating of the area in left field and beyond the uh, beyond the left field fence and in the uh, behind the third base foul line in which there's an opportunity to to gain some additional playing space to extend the, the fence line from 165 feet to potentially 190 feet somewhere in that range again a lot of these uh, will come out during final design as we locate the final uh, locations of the retaining walls and we we move some of the walking paths to extend that area uh, there to accommodate some of those changes we would need to relocate on the proposed site plans where the uh, some of the proposed trees and the proposed scoreboard were initially shown uh, we can find other spaces on on the site or along Elmwood Road or Westview Road to plant additional trees if we can't find spaces on site. Uh, but those were some of the modifications that are very easily incorporated. Uh, there was some discussion about the idea of um, redesigning or changing the concept of the first base bleacher side where uh, currently it's proposed with prefabricated uh, aluminum structures with uh, a walkway behind them. Uh, there was a suggestion to uh, incorporate some sort of stadium style seating with with some sort of concrete bleacher kind of seating where you're utilizing the existing slope uh, and pulling the walkway in front of those. Again, um, the idea would be uh, to we would need to maintain this site as fully ADA compliant. Uh, in order to do that, we could design both seating areas, uh, one uh, each of them as separate alternates on the base bit of the project, and we can make a final selection based upon what the uh, contractor bids come in at. So we can look at both options in the final design stages. Uh, there was also some discussion as far as the paving material for the parking lot along Bloomfield Avenue. And uh, 
I, I think there's obviously a, an awareness that there needs to be some a sensitivity to the stormwater uh, requirements for the site. Uh, all of that is played out in the final design stages when the final stormwater design is is um, is prepared for this final design plan. But as far as the paving materials go, uh, there is an opportunity uh, to install a, a permeable or pervious pavement in that area to help assist with some of the stormwater requirements. I think the idea of of anything less than uh, permeable pavement would be uh, would not be recommended just because of its uh, maintenance concerns um, and the usability concerns and and the uh, the potential for creating uh, either washout of of less uh, less stable materials or or tripping hazards because of of some uh, washout from other kinds of construction materials. But there is certainly an opportunity to design that. And I think the plans actually called for that parking lot to be uh, a poured pervious pavement. Uh, so again, in furtherance of, of uh, advancing the project, I, I think the intention would be to anticipate designing that in that manner. Um, and then the last item that was, was really uh, a, an open discussion point was the final location of the, um, the snack bar restroom and announcement booth. Uh, there was a discussion about potentially reconstructing the existing building or, or building that structure at the location of the existing restroom. Um, there's concern about whether or not um, tying into that existing sewer line would, would be feasible from a, a new location behind home plate. Uh, the the plans anticipated an, an entirely new sanitary sewer run uh, the existing sewer line from that existing structure is uh, it's it's aged. It's um, it doesn't have the proper pitch, and there's a history of backups. And it's uh, the backups I think are largely related to the flatness of that sewer line and the age of the sewer line. So the intention with the project was to construct new sewer lateral for that building, um, regardless of of the final location. But uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with VBSL this morning. Um, they did feel strongly about uh, the location being behind home plate. Uh, they have verbally committed to the donation of that building. And that donation is, is rooted in it being located behind home plate. They felt very strongly about the location. Um, and, and that's... Um, again, I, hopefully the concern about uh, eliminating sewer um, sewer costs, that was going to be a part of the project anyway. So hopefully that mitigates that concern as far as the location uh, and the, the location behind home plate. I think that generally summarizes the point of the project that we're at. Uh, I think, again, uh, to Mr. Diarco's point, the the advancement of the final design allows us to get the project to a point where it can be considered shovel ready and it could be eligible for an application to CDBG when they open up reprogramming funds again. We were successful last year with the ADA uh, playground for the ADA restrooms. Uh, this would present itself as another opportunity if we could advance the design to get it to a quote unquote shovel ready project. Questions, comments for Mr. Sullivan, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, so I will thank uh, both the manager and the deputy manager for meeting this week. Uh, I appreciate your time on this. You did definitely touched on everything we went over. The one addition uh, I did ask for also, and you put it in the email, so you said it would be okay, is a small walkway close to Bloomfield Avenue that goes out to Westview. Yes. Because obviously if people are going to come down to, you know, park. Sometimes they park on Westview so they can come down and have a, uh, some sort of walkway onto uh, onto the field down there. So that thank you for that. Uh, the one thing, uh, as I've stated uh, before, even in council meeting, uh, the location of that field house. Uh, my, my main concern is, number one, the maintenance of it. Uh, the sewer line going that far, and I, I went further and I calculated out to scale – from the drawing, uh, it does run. It's We're going to run a new line. And, of, uh, of course, I knew we're building a new house. We put a new sewer line in. Uh, to run it to Bloomfield Avenue is at least 350 feet. Uh, 
to code quarter inch per foot for sewer lines. That means I, I, I'm okay with this plan, but I, I feel before we move forward, we should get public works to check the depth of the main sewer line on Bluefield Avenue, because calculating that out, that uh, it's about 87, it's seven foot three inches, it has to be below grade to have the proper uh, pitch for that sewer line to make it. Uh, if not, and we have to use ejector pumps, talk to any expert. In, in commercial use, ejector pumps, they just clog. And the maintenance on them is going to just be a nightmare. And of course, it's not going to happen in the middle of winter. It's going to happen in the middle of summer when that field's being used. Uh, and then we're going to be back to Porta Johns there. So I, that, I think moving forward, that's something that's major. I think we have to check that first before we say yes to this. Uh, I'm okay with a lot of the other things. Uh, I do, you know, I, I I go to some games up at Lynn Drive. I go to both of those fields up there. Uh, as far as the field house and do we really need a, a press box up there, I don't think we really use the one at, at Freedom and Liberty that much. So uh, that's the only thing with that. If the BBSL is 100% for that, uh, then I, I may bend on that, but I just don't think that it's something that we really utilize at our other fields. But other than that, I'm okay with all this. I would like to see what we're gonna do with that uh, first baseline along Elmwood Road as far as incorporating uh, the retaining wall in with the bleachers there. Just the concept that we have already. Uh, I, I, I do think that that moves the bleachers back. It, it gives a more, a larger area in front for people that a lot of people do stand to watch the games. Uh, it creates a nicer area there. And it brings that ADA walkway off of the wall behind it. And I just think that keeping that ADA walkway, which has to be level all the way around or a certain, a certain elevation, that means that that's probably the lowest. So you got the highest wall there. I think if we move the ADA walkway in front of the bleachers, it lowers that retaining wall and it, it makes for a smoother transition around the field. Uh, I appreciate your consideration for the uh, third baseline, the north side of the property. Uh, as I stated in our talk, having the bullpen and then the, uh, excuse me, the uh, dugout and then the bullpen right there and the bleachers further down left field, uh, I know they use the bullpen for batting practice also, they have a net on it. It would really have blocked the vision of half the people sitting in the bleachers. So I appreciate that. The area behind it where it is is a perfect location. It could still stay there. Uh, and it it brings the bleachers closer to home plate. So the people, the visitors, that's the visitor's side, uh, they get a better view of the game. So I think that's overall, that's a better fit for that area. Uh, and then I appreciate left field. I, I also spoke to some people on BBSL. They, the left field, 165 feet was a concern, and I know we were all setting that by raising the fence and putting a net above it, but I think if we can get to 185, 190 feet out there, uh, I think that's ideal for that. I mean, right field's going to be 205. Uh, Liberty Field is, the, the walls up there are 245 feet. So I think it opens up, uh, I think, a greater amount of people that can play up there for that. So I appreciate your time and the revisions. I look forward to seeing them on paper, but I, I will obviously say yes to move forward to do this, uh, pending any other concerns of the rest of the council. If I could just answer the one of your comments, the, yeah. I did uh, have an opportunity to also speak with our public works department today about the depth of the sewer on Bloomfield Avenue. Okay. Um, they, the, the, the sewer line is deep enough to accommodate the sewer run. The other thing that we do have working for us, for us is that the home plate location is the higher point on the, the the site compared to center field in the parking lot. So we do have the slope working with us. We're not fighting pitch on that. So between the slope that's working with us and the depth of the sewer line on Bluefield Avenue, we were able to confirm that that design would work. As I've mentioned, the first base seating side rule have dual designs to put that out mm -hmm. for uh, alternate bid options. And I look forward to seeing that. I, I have plans to talk to a couple other people on VUSL. I, I also think, and I didn't bring this up, but I think having the bathrooms and the snack bar behind home plate, I, I do think it's a bit of a distraction. I also think that's a good revenue maker for the BBSL. Uh, so to put it all the way there, a lot of people stay in the parking lot uh, to watch the game. So that moving it to the location of where it is right now, 
I think it'll be a more active and 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 more revenue generating uh, area for that. But that's up to them. If they think the same, then uh, I will I'll definitely be presenting that to them during the week. Questions? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, PVSL was, was firm on their building this building, they're donating it to the township. It offsets the cost for us. And that's where they wanted it. We affirmed that today. I will go back to the Shade Tree Commission. We didn't have time. They were one of the stakeholders that I uh, don't think it's a big issue with the trees and planting them in other locations. But that was from our original meetings with the, all the stakeholders, Environmental Commission, Shade Tree. We kind of did all that homework for you ahead of time. In BBSL, we we're on the phone again today just to confirm their position on the building they're donating. So, so we need, would like to have the authorization of the council to go out and get the final design. That's not going out to bidding. That's not going to bonding. We can't move forward unless we go into final design. We'll be discussing these tweaks for a long time if we don't. And you'll see that in the engineering and, and those aspects that have to be done on topography, engineering, drainage, compliance with uh, stormwater. You don't get that in a conceptual design. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hall. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for your diligence and perseverance on this project, Kevin and Joe. Um, I know that this was a, another one of your long list items that we gave you when you came to the Township of Verona. I think it's really important to revitalize this field. Um, we have a tremendous baseball and softball community here in Verona. Um, they're was a huge number of kids enrolled in the program this past spring. I was very impressed to see it. And I think it's so important for us to have an important and revitalized recreational as, um, asset on Bloomfield Avenue. It is something that people see when they drive into our community and it should be a showpiece for our community. I think this concept plan is definitely getting us there. I wanna compliment you both on leveraging grant funding um, for, and from the state, as well as uh, working collaboratively with stakeholders and constituents like the DBSL to get this in-kind contribution. I think it's really important that we were able to reduce the cost of this for, rape, uh, for our taxpayers. And I, I do think that it's worthwhile for us to get to that granular uh, final, um, final planning stage. So I would be willing to move forward so that you have what you need so that we can start ironing out some of these wrinkles, as I said earlier, and we can make sure that this project is ready to move forward and we can get to a final design so that we can go out to bid instead of um, continuing to try and work on this concept plan when really the time and place to do that is in the final design stage. So again, I wanna thank you so much for taking us through this process and I'm very comfortable with you moving to final design. So thank you so much. Uh, just some brief comments. Obviously, thank you for all the work that's gone into this. Um, as far as the construction specifics, I do look to the de deputy mayor for his analysis of this. So everyone that's up here, he knows building construction and the pitfalls that you can get into in, in building a facility very, very well. So I appreciate his analysis on, on that. And, uh, and hopefully a lot of his ideas can get incorporated into this project. Um, what I really am concerned about myself is amplified sound. Um, that's the one thing that I would be opposed to having at this location. Um, I think that in terms of just basically you know, protecting the neighborhood and so on, that's something that I think that should not be happening here. Uh, so I wanted to ask what the current thoughts are on, on that as far as a, a usage policy. The one, well, the one positive aspect would be in the position behind home play and any amplified sound would be directed towards Bloomfield Avenue. We don't have their exact schedule when, when lights go, they're on, that's when the lights go out. Um, so whatever the time frame of games, that's when it would be amplified sound. And we could discuss the decibel level with the PVs with them um, for meetings, very honestly. But the one positive aspect is, is all the trees behind it and versus the sound going from where it is now, if it was to be built there, directed right towards residential homes versus where it is proposed, 
it's actually directing it towards Bloomfield Avenue, which may be a plus for the residents. All right, but sound is, you know, sound is not unidirectional. It does it does disperse a lot. There are houses that are immediately adjacent to this field. It doesn't, you know, you could point the speaker down at the ground and they're still going to hear it. Understood. Um, it's still, you know, it's still something that would be pretty disturbing on a, you know, on a weekend to the rest of the neighborhood to have that. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, my my biggest concern there. Any other comments, Council? Yeah. Council room? No, I didn't. If I may just Council Mahal, yes. So in the final design plan, though, we would make sure that any facilities we were constructing would be compliant with DEP regulations, such as the noise regulations, right? So I, I think that might get to your actual concern, is that we would have to make sure that any facility constructed would not be creating noise pollution that would violate any of the state regulatory standards. I'm not so much worried about where the regulatory standards record is. My opinion is that if somebody is in their house and can hear it, it's too much. Um, I just, I don't, you know, this field where this is located, this is a neighborhood facility. This is, you know, right next to people's houses. Um, I simply don't want someone sitting there, you know, all all day on a, on a weekend day hearing announcements. I'll close out the conversation on this then. Um, um, yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I, I think we, everyone up here on this council, I don't usually say that to speak for everybody, but we all want this field to get done. Uh, and we wanted to get, go to design. I'm willing to say yes right now, but we have to keep in mind, we're building a field for the kids. We're not building a, a playground for the kids. We're not building a snack stand for the kids. We're not building bathrooms for the kids. All those are important, but we're here to design a field so that it's playable for baseball and softball. We're talking about all these other things that go out here. You know, We're off on, just let's get the field squared away first and then worry about all those other things around it. And and I think we have the field set. The one major was left field, and we're moving it out a little bit more. So let's uh, – I'm willing to say yes just to get this going to final design, but I want to see the final design before I say yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That was the intention, Mayor, to yep. get it to final design so you can see all the engineerings, and you'll see those final designs as the community will be, and then we'll be able to, with your authorization, bond and go out to bid. Uh, any other comments like the speaker announcing whatever? We'll talk to BBSL and find out what exactly is your plan for this and, and how you'd be announcing. We're seeing too many little league games where they love to hear their name announced. So we'll talk to them. So I'll, I'll close out the conversation in thank you, the administration, for your work on this. It is something that I, I, I will reflect the deputy mayor, and he stole a little bit of my thunder, but He's great, so it's fine. Uh, but I think this is everything, something that we've all agreed on, on getting done from the start. I know it's something that I, I pushed uh, as soon as I got on council. I, I think when a design like this and, and putting everything together and trying to make a design that will last for multiple generations of kids going through, that it is a bit of a process. Uh, I appreciate the administration and Neglia responding to concerns we, for the public certification. This concept plan had kind of been revised at times, but I appreciate the the, uh, the deputy mayor using not only his common sense, but also his background in building to come up with some suggestions for, for here as well. Um, and I think that shows good teamwork. I, and this is a process that when we build anything, we want to make it well, in government, it does take a little time to do. So uh, I appreciate everybody's comments. I appreciate the public comments um, and and ask for the public's understanding as we, you know, government work isn't done immediately. As Mr. Giarco has 55 years experience and the government could probably tell us, um, but I, I'm glad to see the project moving forward. I think the, the tweaks of the concept plan are positive um, and, I believe I can, based on the comments, speak for the council and say to the administration, you have our go ahead to go to the final design phase. I think as far as policy for usage, we have usage policies for all of our fields, right? When they can be used, by whom they can be used. That's where your sound goes, piece goes into. Um, parking, you know, things like that. We need to have some, that's, 
conversations that we have down the road. Um, and I would expect the, the rec committee to provide some feedback on that and our director of community services and VBSL, uh, because in the end, just like the comment I brought up with uh, Lakeside Avenue an hour ago, we are in a neighborhood and we have to be good neighbors and we have to make sure that providing a benefit for certain individuals doesn't negate the the health, safety, and life quality problems, right? So that's that's really where we are. Though in all, I think that the redesign of this field will improve the quality of life for the neighborhoods, um, especially with the playground that I desperately wanted. And I thank you for including that in there. Um, but I think it, in the end, it does increase quality of life. And honestly, for anybody that drives the drone, it'll increase the quality of life by not looking at the current so, uh, which is a I think a stain on our wonderful township uh, infrastructure. So uh, let's do it. Thank you, Mayor. And unsaid credit for the council concerning the, all the grants that we've been able to achieve was really driven by the governing body um, charging us to find every feasible way to reduce the cost of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything else for your report, Mr. Jack? No, um, I have no voice left. Okay. So we're going to go to council reports. I'm going to uh, relinquish the chair of the deputy mayor so I can have a health break. Um, and he'll continue with the meet, his report in the end. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my report is short tonight. Uh, I will echo the mayor's uh, thank you to the public works and our emergency services for their work. Last night during the storm, uh, and all they do during those uh, those late hours in the dark when it's, things are overflowing and it's pretty dangerous out there. Uh, thankfully, this area didn't get hit all that bad. Right. However, it was bad, but other areas like Connecticut got really, uh, really hit pretty hard, and I, I feel for them and wish them well. Uh, the only other thing I have is the uh, Sustainable Verona had a meeting and I will have more details at the next council meeting, but they are going to have an EV fair on October 5th. Uh, details and location uh, will be uh, at the next meeting. And uh, that is all I have for this evening. So I will pass it on for council report from Councilman Rowan. All right, comments are uh, similarly going to be brief. Uh, also, thank you to the Township's uh, Emergency Services Public Works Department for getting us through that storm. They always do a fantastic job in, in uh, dealing with those events. I'm glad we didn't have uh, more issues than we did. And I will also wish Councilwoman Holland a happy birthday. It's very important. Oh, thank you. It's not my birthday currently. It was. <laughs> it was recently, since our previous meeting. Thank Councilwoman you. Holland, you're next, and happy birthday. So, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm a year older. Um, <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, right? There's also, yeah, I've, just, I, I've, I've moved past my birthday, so I just, just aren't me. Um, so I just want to acknowledge um, that it is August and um, we are taking a break from some of our regularly scheduled advisory committees as we prepare for the start of the school year. So um, I just want to recognize those committees and I look forward to meeting with them again in September. I also want to acknowledge some of the significant rain events that we've had lately after a very dry summer. I am aware that some of our friends and neighbors have definitely experienced another flooding event in their neighborhoods and that this is very troubling and that this most recent rainstorm last evening was not as significant as some of the ones that we saw in 2021 and 2018. Uh, 2018. And it really reminds us that there's just more work to be done. Um, so I want to thank the Township Administration for your continued leadership. I know that you've worked hard to address and mitigate some of the concerns of various neighborhoods. I know that there's more work to be done. I did receive feedback from some residents in the Forest Avenue um, area. So I, I do hope that there's opportunity to address some of their concerns as well. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge that Labor Day weekend is coming up. So I hope everybody has a healthy and safe holiday at the end of the month or the beginning of next month. And um, I want to just acknowledge that my daughter and I will be running in the Labor Day Classic. So I won't be beating anyone on this council, but it will be fun to run with my daughter for the first time. Um, so that concludes my report. Thank you so much. Thank you. This time I will open for public comment on any item anybody will wish to discuss before the council. Madam Clerk, would you please read the public participations? <laughs> Anyone from the public <clears throat> wishing to speak on any matter, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button on your monitor. If you're dialing in by phone, you can press star nine. If you're attending in person, please raise your hand before approaching the lectern. Once recognized, clearly state only your name and township of residence for rec um, township of residence for the record. You are not required to provide your street address. However, if you do, please note that these meetings will be posted on the township's YouTube channel. The addresses will not be redacted for any purpose. You'll have four minutes to address the council. There will be no cross dialogue. After everyone wishing to speak has been heard, the council may address your comments and your questions. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Badessa, welcome. Hi, Mr. Badessa. Verona. I won't give you my address, but you probably know where I live anyway. <laughs> I had uh, an idea. In my neighborhood, someone has painted one of the street poles, or the light, the poles purple, or maroon, actually. Can we have a project or contest or something? Uh, stripe poles, uh, solid, solid maroon, gray stripes. Polka dots, just just something for fun. That's that's all that is. And I understand, Mr. Mayor, you went to Italy. I did. Would you like to tell us about your trip? Did you meet your colleague? I I will tell you after public comment is is over. Okay. Yeah. So that's that is planned. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening, everybody. Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, uh, Mr. Yarko, Councilwoman, how you doing? Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, oh, sorry, Corey, Corey Shore. Just give your name. Yeah. Sorry, Corey Shore, Verona. Um, Everfield, um, very um, happy today about the continuation going forward uh, for Everfield. Um, I do agree uh, with the mayor about the uh, sound policy, is that every field that we see has some type of sound policy, whether, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock uh, at night, while living in the forest area. Uh, I know I was walking with my kids, and every morning on Saturday, like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I hear uh, the football announcements. So um, I know there's concerns about the community and the, the sound, but... You know, it's not going to, I don't think it will happen at like nine, 10 o'clock at night or, you know, six o'clock in the morning. So I just, I understand the community, but I think there should be some kind of, you know, policy and the committees obviously will look into it and give some recommendations. Uh, the solar pa panel project um, is something that um, I've been emailing uh, the deputy town, town uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, deputy town uh, mayor on this. Um, I also agree. That I'd like to see uh, the pool looked at as well, because I think there is a lot of space there at the parking lot to generate energy. Uh, I want to thank the council for moving from six to nine members um, at the recreational committee. Um, I know we're in a 20 day period before that passes, but our next meeting is in mid September, September 17th. So if it's possible to you know, look at the appointments potentially and maybe at the next meeting and pass some appointees, I know. Uh, the clerk is working very hard to um, get that process going. And I'd like to thank uh, Community Affairs and the Recreational um, Department. Um, two days ago, three days ago, the fall programs rolled out. And um, I saw a lot of programs, a lot of um, kids that were not on the wait list anymore, that they were just assigned into their, whether it's soccer or, um, or uh, one of the other um, programs. I had no complaints, which was very nice. And um, I saw that some of the week programs that the kids were getting, uh, that some of our programs were starting after 3.15, which was much better than 2 o'clock, was not conducive for working families. So I want to thank the uh, Community Affairs. I'd like to thank Dave. I'd like to thank 
uh, to Michael, I think to the entire team there who are working with us over the last couple of years at Recreation uh, Committee to get that done. So um, have a great uh, Labor Day. Uh, have a great rest of the summer, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for hearing me today. My name is Lauren Yen and I live in Verona. Um, I appreciate the comments about the noise in Everett Field. I also appreciate consideration of time frames. I will say that um, as a mother of a young daughter, I'm so excited that we are going to move forward with this. Hopefully she's better at softball than I was. <laughs> Horrible. But what I do remember about softball is that it wasn't about like all the stuff that we had. It was about what color t-shirts we had, where we were going for ice cream after. It was about uh, picking daisies, or for me, it was about picking daisies in the outfield um, and just really being with my friends. And I think that that's like purely American and nostalgic and kind of what baseball is supposed to be. Um, so I do ask for consideration about the noise being that I do live very close to this place. I do think that it goes beyond whether someone's trying to sleep. Um, maybe just that like cup of coffee that I'm trying to have on my back deck at noon to get through the rest of my weekend day after a hard day at work. Um, I appreciate that kids want to hear their names called. Um, but I did take my daughter on a very, very, very expensive vacation for her to meet all the princesses on a cruise ship. And all she wanted to do was be in this tiny thing. When we got back to Verona, it was Memorial Day, and we went to the pool. And I book her back in school. She didn't talk about the princesses. She didn't talk about the food. She talked about going to our town pool. And to kids, I think that's really what matters. It doesn't matter if they have a state-of-the-art PA system. They just need a safe place to play. So, thank you. Thank you. That's <laughs> Hi, Sarah O'Farrell, Verona, New Jersey. At the August 5th meeting, like many others I've attended, I rose to express myself over an item that concerns me and many of my neighbors. I'm always polite. I try to keep it simple and friendly, and I feel that I express myself clearly and calmly. As a stakeholder, my opinion was dismissed as if this, discu as if this discussion is a one-way street. I was clear in discussing Everett Field that my older children had grown up playing there, which at the time had a working bathroom, snack bar and grounds maintained by the volunteer parents, including me. I was clear that I would like to see an improved concession stand and the much needed ADA bathrooms and that the field is very important and should undergo improvements. I stood to merely express my opinion and my objection to a PA system that will carry through the neighborhood each time a game is played and sought to maintain a large, beautiful existing sycamore tree that was not displayed on the plants. Apparently my residency in our town and my residency near Everett do not qualify me as a stakeholder of one of our public parklands. What would qualify me? And after I spoke, one of the VBSL parents stated that he understands about the PA system noise and said that he himself doesn't like it near his home and that a sound system wouldn't be a deal breaker for them. Again, we did not buy our home next to an existing sports complex. Still, it was answered with, of course, there will be a policy that will limit the use of the sound system, as if there is such a policy within Verona's current code that limits PA system use, because there isn't. Verona's Chapter 339 noise under 339-2C. Loudspeakers, amplifiers, the use of calliopes, mechanical loudspeakers, or amplifiers of any kind for any purpose upon the street of the township is enumerated as an act found to be loud, disturbing, and making unnecessary noise in violation of the code. So it's quite the opposite of what was referred to as a basic standard. Sound systems aren't a basic standard. The basic standard is that residents are afforded the right to live in peace without undue noise or nuisance. Cedar Grove's new state-of-the-art Little League field on Grove Avenue doesn't have a PA system, nor do the Little League fields for Roseland, Fairfield, Essex Fells, Caldwell, or West Caldwell. I feel 
that I was invalidated from my right to stand here and protect our neighborhood from a condition that doesn't currently exist and should not exist going forward, even according to our own code. And we can also hear the football games where we live at um, Everett Field all the way from the high school. I can hear the score. I can hear everything. The noise does travel. It's very loud. And I think that our piece is just as important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll close public comment. Um, to Mr. Modesto's point, I know the poll you're talking about uh, as I walk by it every day with your front radar. Uh, I guess the question that I have for the Township Administration is, is it actually legal to paint a street pole any color but the metal? Is there any, is there anything that prohibits the... Good, good question, Mayor. I don't know. I'll have to look at <laughs> I, it's a, please do. That's right. I think the, the idea of having some neighborhood contests on that is kind of a cool concept. So, um, but I can tell you the, the maroon painted one in my neighborhood certainly was an improvement over the one that was kind of rusting. Um, that would be good to, to look into. It might be something for like a fall bench or something like that. Get people to pay to paint them. That would be even better. <laughs> uh, to uh, Mr. Podesta asking about my, my trip to Italy, um, I did have the opportunity to visit Brown in uh, Italy for a short time, only a couple hours, unfortunately, with our itinerary. Mayor Tomasi was not there when I was there, but he did love the flag that we gave them and all the students with whom I was traveling, my 80 closest friends. Um, the picture in front of the the uh, Roman Coliseum, which is a beautiful landmark uh, with the flag. And uh, I was able to get the flag to the mayor uh, and his uh, one of his staff members was able to take it. And I did get a, a call from his chief of staff and uh, inviting me back, unfortunately, our, our itinerary just didn't work for it. But if I'm in Rome, Italy in the next, you know, 10, 10 months again, I will be stopping in. Uh, they were very nice. And um, the Italian administration also provided a, a hat, which she was tickled to have as well. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Shore, as always, I appreciate your your insight and your willingness to uh, to look at the policies. I think that uh, we have some applications for the rec committee that are outstanding. So we may be in a position to do an appointment at our next meeting uh, because the 20 day theory will have been satisfied. So I see no reason not to uh, to move forward with appointments for our first September. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could just resend those to everybody, just so we know, that would be wonderful. Uh, to Lauren, I'm sorry I didn't catch your, your last name. I really appreciate your, your sentiment. Um, as somebody who played right field and left out in, in baseball uh, as a kid, um, I, despite being a horrible baseball player, um, I still enjoy and remember fondly my time doing it. So, um, and frankly, I, I think you're right in that I don't necessarily, I don't think I'd be able to describe the, the field to you right now, but could certainly describe the, the fun that I had there. But uh, Mr. O'Farrell, I'm sorry that, um, well, I think I, as you, you know, um, appreciate your your sentiments and something that I discussed earlier. I do apologize for the dismissiveness by which you were treated by one of my colleagues and uh, and I, I know I'm committed to hearing all public comment um, and receive emails. We talk to the public all the time, but I don't want that to dissuade you from coming here and sharing your thoughts again, especially as we as we move forward with this project that is a few feet from your house. So please come back and please share your thoughts. Um, any other comments on public comment? All right. Um, that concludes the public comment. We will be going into our hearing and adoption of ordinances. The 
Uh, next item on the agenda is ordinance number 2024-28 on second reading. Madam Clerk, would you please read the title of this ordinance into the record? An ordinance amending the standards of the C2 Professional Office of Business Zone District by establishing assisted living facilities as a conditional use for working space as a patient. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, would somebody move the ordinance, please? So I'm still on. I'll take uh, Councilman Roman for the motion. Is there a second? I'll say. A second by the Deputy Mayor. And now it's time for public hearing on Ordinance 2024-28. Same public comment statement as earlier applies. However, the comment is limited only to this ordinance. Okay, I don't see anybody jumping out of their chairs on this one. Is there any council discussions? Very on, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Councilman Holland. Yes. Councilman Roman. Yes. Deputy Mayor McAvoy. Yes. Mayor Tamboro. Yes. Mayor, uh, 2024 and 28 passes board zero will be published according to law. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're moving on to our post resolutions. We have a light um, consent agenda this evening. We have the August 5th, 2020 minutes. We are accepting the National Opioid Grant and refunding escrow. And we do have a resolution for executive session, which will be happening this evening. Would somebody like to move the consent agenda? So moved. Motion is made by the Deputy Mayor. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second is made by Councilman Roman. Now it's time for public comment on consent agenda items. The same public applies. The comment is limited to these four resolutions and the minutes. Anybody has comments on this? Very none. Uh, any council comments? Very none. Madam Clerk, to call the roll, please. Yes, we'll be hollering. Yes. Councilman Roman. Yes. Deputy Mayor McAvoy. Yes. Mayor Chamburo. Yes. Mayor, uh, resolutions K1 and K4 will be numbered 143 through and including 146. Uh, okay. We do have an addendum, but I believe you're pulling the resolution on the addendum. Are we moving forward with this? That's okay. so the administration's removing that from the agenda, so we do not even need to table that. We will move on to doing unfinished business. Uh, first item on of new unfinished business this evening is the proposed attendance policy, which I thank the township attorney for drafting uh, at my request. Um, well, I'm pulling this up. Does any consumer have any comment on this? Uh, so, with Councilman Holland this time. Thank you. Um, I think this is worthwhile, and I really just want to say thank you to the Recreation Advisory Committee for bringing this forward. I know that it was a strong recommendation that came forward from the committee. I'm grateful to see it moving forward. It is certainly something that I had raised at prior meetings, and I want to thank Mr. Shore's leadership in uh, bringing this to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Any other comments on the policy? Yes. yes. A couple, Deputy Mayor? Just a couple of questions of uh, in section one here. We have any public member that does not attend the required number of meetings shall be notified by the appointing party. We have town council, mayor, or manager. Let's just be the clerk. Since the clerk. Oh. No, that would be the, the uh, appointing authority. So the person or the group that appoints them would be in control of removal. It usually removals the same way. So my idea was to have the whomever it was that appointed that act as a group or act as an individual who did the appointment to contact her. Okay. Because that would be the same person who will decide ultimately if they should be removed. Okay. I, I had kind of the same thought as the deputy mayor and that, Mr. Loya. Um, we tried to that was just my thought. Yeah, I, I do think maybe if we just add in um, through the township clerk, perhaps, whereas, you know, for the notification through the township clerk and that way, we have the records maintained if the clerk is doing those emails and it's, everything's one place. 
um, because Clark handles everything else related to committee appointments. So I think you're right in that the appointing authority would need to initiate the notification, but I agree with the deputy mayor that the notification should actually be made by the township clerk. We cannot move that address. And my thought there also was because the, the clerk, we actually appoint and the clerk notifies. Call up the appointments. The, when we do appoint, yes. The, the other one here, like within 14 calendar days of notification, the member may appeal the decision of removal by requesting a hearing. Uh, can, should we maybe, or maybe add if necessary? Because uh, I'm just thinking back to uh, there was an appointment on one of our uh, on our zoning board where someone was in a car accident and they didn't attend for I think it was six months uh, and and no one really knew it. So I mean, obviously, if they're notified, uh, then they just say, "Well, here I was in a car accident," or if there's some reason they didn't make it, and that's an acceptable uh, the, the hearing. The hearing isn't a uh, necessarily a formal. A hearing with like a judge or whatever. So in that instance, okay. they would receive the notice. They would say, "Hey, here's my doctor's note, or here's whatever." Or the family would contact. Or Verona being small, in many instances, you would actually know that and wouldn't even get to the notice. So the appointing authority, although it goes through the clerk, um, would take that in consideration before they even sent the letter. Right? If you didn't know and the person just wasn't showing up, then obviously the letter goes up. Who goes out rather, or if they didn't hit the right number of the percent of meetings, let them know how if you knew that they were out again for medical for themselves or their family, you wouldn't even write the letter. You just let them know no, that's John, and they were only 65 percent with their back now in the loop. They haven't missed a meeting in the last four meetings, but they were out because you know they had a family member sick or they didn't just in the next paragraph, the same thing with the uh, no marriage, yeah, same stall. Thank you. I, I have a couple comments, Mr. Loya. Uh, the, in the writing, it says all public members of the township quite to at least 70% of meetings held each year. When we're saying, we're saying year. Calendar year? Okay. I, yeah. So would, however, we define that? I'll do calendar. So it would be interesting if somebody, this is something we have to, to start thinking about, is whether it should be calendar year or whether it should be an eight year. Because if somebody misses a meeting in December, then misses a meeting in March, and then misses a meeting in June, they've missed three meetings in relatively close time. So I would I would rephrase it as if maybe as um, in any year period in any in any twelve months versus a year. In any 12 months. And that way it can be dynamic because some people are appointed in July, some people are appointed in, in December. Um, the other thing that I would ask to be included in here is, is that this is done by uh that the uh it has to be put on the agenda. On the so if it's a mayoral or or manager appointment, it would be listed as in their specific agenda. If it's a council matter, it should be done by resolution. So then it's a debatable, uh, it's a debatable item. So there would be a resolution to agree to notify them. And then there would be a, a resolution potentially on an appeal. So be on the mayor's agenda, manager's report, or council will pass by resolution. Council will pass by resolution. A, a uh, agreement stating that the person's next up next to the is out. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think it's this looks good. I think the appeal fine lines are are helpful. Um, and it's a worthwhile policy, especially when we have committees that have a lot of interest to make sure that we maintain that we have the right people on committees. Any anything else? Oh, fine, for the future. Madam Clerk, do you have any comments knowing that you administer this? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but because you're our person on this. Actually, I have a question. Please. If, would the committee chairs, should they be recording current meetings on the attendance or just as this comes up and it's 
they realize that it's been close to 70 percent well we should be getting minutes right is there so i think that that is i'll keep track through the minutes yeah, that i receive that would be the best way that to do it be um because i don't know it's difficult for us but the committee chairs in role of enforcement of the ordinance so i think we should probably keep track on on the uh on the okay. but i think one of the things is is that it, as i think we spoke about before having kind of an sop guide for committee chairs is making sure or when they send the minutes or whatever they could just actually make it very easy and just put an email who was absent right if somebody comes in halfway through the meeting in my opinion, they made an attempt to be there. They're present, right? I don't want to, you know, disqualify anybody for that reason. But I think for the public's edification, our reason of doing that is not to just remove people from the committees because we're the appointing authority of the committees is to make sure that we have the, the right people on the committees who are consistently present in order to make decisions. One of the issues that we have is when people are absent and then have to deliberate on something that had been an item of discussion in a previous meeting, unless they were able to to view and not every, uh, not all of our committees record. So if, for instance, if you're the NASA model examples of the planning board and the zoning board, where we do actually have recordings of those meetings, if we miss a meeting and want to participate, we actually have to sign an affidavit that we've watched the entire meeting, uh, in the entire meeting in its, it's length and reviewed every document, which can get very interesting if you have really big documents that were on a projector or something like that that you have to look at. So sometimes our numbers simply don't participate because it's actually onerous to try to recreate the meeting. Any other items on this? Okay. All right, I think we can put this on first May. May. Yes. We may have to go back to agenda. Your request of removal. Um, item one, but not item two. No, I know that's the second on because the addendum as a discussion item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so first reading for this meeting September, Mr. Lawyer. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And our next item of new and unfinished business is a discussion of um, having a resolution to authorize the planning board to conduct a preliminary investigation to determine whether property located at 383 Bloomfield Avenue, which is the corner of Bloomfield and Park, uh, to the east is a non-condemnation area to redevelopment. Uh, we have our planner here to assist us in this process. I'm sorry. We're up, you're up on the 383 Bloomfield. If you have any thoughts, comments, presentation. Well, it, it'll be that. Are you talking about head press, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, the assistant administrator, uh, myself, met with Hillcrest, I think, was it two months ago, three months ago? Yes, in June. In June, right. Um, so we, um, you know, I did a preliminary a review of the site, and I think uh, just based on that, um, it has potential for an area in need of redevelopment investigation. Um, and, um, you know, once authorized, we'll be happy to start the study. So just for the public, we, we recently did this with another property not too far from here. Right? 320 Blue. 320 Blue. The process is, is that if we if we authorize the planning board to do this, then you do the redevelopment, the study of right. return. If the criteria, which of the criteria, if any, that allow under statute an area need of redevelopment would apply in this circumstance, you then right. present that to the planning board, at which right. the planning board conducts the, the investigation of the meeting, the law of the abilities, public comment, right. and then the planning board sends a report back to the council with a, a firm negative response correct so basically um it's very technical um everything is as per the uh, local redevelopment and housing law at rhl um there are six criteria very specific uh we have to provide evidence so um you know I, again i 
care plans where they'll meet or not meet, but it ha shows potential. And it is the, the property owner, the developer, that pays for correct? So it differ to uh, who pay for that. So, so the property owner, in the last case, did this property owner has indicated uh, that they will do a reimbursement. The attorney had concerns of funding it initially. Okay. But, so there just be a backwards. So the township would also end up with the owner first time. Any so, questions? Or, yeah, are we looking to move this tonight for anticipation at? You can certainly move it tonight. And the council, the only reason this was on for a, a new business is because sometimes the council wants things in new business before you move it. But again, as the mayor has indicated, this is just simply a resolution sending it to the planning board to do a study. So you're not really a call taking any action. <clears throat> yeah, and this is a resolution on the ordinance. That's correct. And the resolution is in your back. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Yes. I uh what's somebody I'd like to the resolution. I would Move forward. So moved. I will second it. Any discussion on the resolution itself? Look forward to the report. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, I will open public comment on this Ooh. item only. Same public comment, same we replies. Move. We have to public comment on public comment. And public comment on 33 Bloomfield Avenue. Fair enough. Close public comment. And any further council discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilwoman Holland. Yes. Councilman Roman. Yes. Deputy Mayor McAvoy. Yes. Mayor Tambora. Yes. Mayor, um, resolution M2 will be number 2024-147 and will be referred to the planning board. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And the, at this point, I will open for public comment unless anybody has any other business. Um, um, public comment on any item that anybody would like to discuss. Same public comment statement applies. Okay. Hearing none, I will close public comment. We have passed a resolution to go into executive session. Will any official action be taken? No. I think if that is the case, we will see everybody at our next meeting in September. Thank you very much. Okay.